So tonight we're going to hear about, um, so you guys hear a lot of info from me and from Dr. Steele and, and folks. Um, I thought it would be instructive to hear from somebody that's employed and has been employed for a long time outside of academia. And some of those options and possibilities maybe for a career. So my friend uh, Shelly Angara, I've known for a long time. Um, I don't know how long, but a long time. 1998. 1998? No, before then, right? 97. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely 1997. So uh, anyway, so um, amongst other things, we went to the same undergraduate institution, but we really most closely worked together uh, in graduate school. So she was in one department, I was in another department, but uh, my sort of co-advisor was her main advisor, so we, we collaborated a lot. And some of you guys in some classes have heard me talk about our Magoo Lagoon wetland restoration. Shelly was part of that, our initial team, to figure out how we might want to go about looking at the health of the wetland and assessing what was going on. Um, but whereas I thought, I didn't know what I thought. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was in graduate school. I don't, I don't think I knew. Did I know that? I don't think I knew what I wanted to do. But, but academia seemed like a possibility. Um, my friend Shelly was like, I'm not going to be an academic. Like, I want to do consulting. I want to do stuff outside of academia. She was always very driven and always um, was very uh, purposeful about her decisions, even when things would get sort of crazy at times. Um, and I thought it would be great for her to come in and talk about her particular trajectory, her particular career. So I would go over that, but she's, I think, gonna, she's gonna run through that for us, right? Yeah. So um, one, I think uh, Shelly's a fantastic person just to have, and she, in the past, you, none of you guys, I think you're all too young, but historically I, I'd had, I've had Shelly come and talk to various other groups at, at various points in time. Um, her particular specialty is looking at um, coastal toxicology, coastal toxicity, particularly as associated with sediments. So her PhD did a bunch of things, but among other things, looked at how toxic some of our sediments in our coastal systems are, coastal estuaries. Amongst other things, not just looking at, not just looking at is this stuff good or bad, but also looking at some of the methodology. So is this critter the right critter to um, to assess how how toxic say some um, estuarine sediment mud silt actually is? So she carried that interest on into her consulting world, and we'll hear about that. But um, also the thing I really like about Shelley is she's also um, not only interested in herself and her own personal journey, which is important for you guys to be able to look out for yourself, but she's also really um, interested in helping other folks come along. How can she, how can we help, uh, you know, uh, help the younger folks follow in, in her path or things like that. So I thought she's a perfect speaker to one, give us an example of the kind of careers you guys and, and some of the opportunities you guys might want to consider if you haven't considered them. Two, if you are con thinking about the consulting world, some, some lessons and some things to think about. And then lastly, so we'll do that. So I'm, I'm, we're recording this. So I'm just going to record the first little few minutes as she tells a little bit about her story. Then I'm going to turn that off. Right? So for most of this discussion today, this is not recorded. This is just us being honest and talking about stuff. But also I asked Shelly if she would talk in particular about some of the, the challenges in our modern workplace and how we deal with some of those things. Um, in a multitude of uh, directions and a multitude of facets. So that'll come on. So this is gonna be a mix of hearing from Shelly and also having some discussion and feedback. So you guys should absolutely feel free to speak up and ask, maybe not with your mouth full of pizza, but after you've <laughs> digested your pizza. Um, by all means, I, I think you should feel free to ask questions exactly. and stuff, right? Okay, so without further ado, my friend, uh, Dr. Shelly Angara. <laughs> Like, like Sean said, we've known each other for a long time, and um, I've had, lo looking back now, I'll just start <laughs> off right now and say I'm 49 years old, so I have had a, wow. pre <laughs> <laughs> I've had a pretty varied career, for, um, and I've kind of dabbled in a lot of different things, and it, it's only until like this age am I actually feeling <laughs> really empowered for the first time, where... Um, 
I, I've gotten to a point where I'm just not willing to do things other people's <laughs> way. You know, I mean, it takes a long time to get yourself into that level of confidence and and so it's kind of an interesting place for me and I've just started a brand new career with that in mind. And so I am exactly pretty much in the same position that you guys are all in right now. I have absolutely, with all of my experience, I have absolutely no idea where I'm gonna be in a year from now, none. I have, I have all these ideas, I've kind of invested um, in thinking things are gonna go a certain way, I've kind of, <laughs> built up my bank account because I'm old <laughs> enough to do that. I have a retirement plan that has started, which I'm sure none of you are thinking about that right now, but you don't have children and, and mortgages yet, probably. So, <clears throat> so it's kind of an interesting place to come and talk to you because everything that I've gone through, there's like no right and no wrong. There's, it's a completely individual path. And for all of the obstacles that I've had, in the things that haven't been good and then the opportunities that have been amazing, you, you can't like look back and say, well, I wish I had done it differently because it's just this huge long journey. And that was part of the reason of why I'm starting my career all brand, brand new at this age is because I'm like, okay, I've got 15 years now until I think I'm gonna retire. That's what my financial <laughs> analyst says I can do. And so I'm like, okay, for 15 years, I'm just going to try something totally different. I am ready to grow again. And it's it's my version of going back to graduate school. I have no desire to go back to school again. <laughs> <laughs> Too many years there. But it's it's that the kind of exercise where I'm at. So, so this, you know, my presentation today is kind of broken into three sections. One, I was just going to tell you a little bit about my career path and where I am and why I made a lot of the decisions that I did. Um, and have a little bit of discussion with you guys about, you know, and have you kind of think, would you have made those kinds of decisions for yourself? And thinking about how you would have made a different decision than me really shapes kind of the society that we live in. Everybody's going to make different decisions about what you're going to feel passionate about and what you can live with and what you can't live with. And, and so, like I said, there's, it's going to be, an, I think, an interesting discussion <laughs> to have you have your opinion on some of the decisions that I've made with my career. The second part of the discussion is about um, um, uh, God, diversity and, um, and empowerment and about where we are. Right now, there's been so much in the news about sexual harassment and gender discrimination and well, I have, I've been very fortunate, and I've never had any sexual harassment. I've had the opposite, opposite happen to me. I've had a huge amount of, of gender discrimination placed on me um, over the last 20 years. Never in academia, always after academia. And, um, and so I have that set of experiences. So I was going to have us, the middle of today's discussion, talk about um, unconscious bias and why we're in this situation where there is this um, gender um, issues and it's not just gender, it's race, it's it's all different kinds. It's we're in a melting pot and people have very set ideas about what they're expecting people to be like you know, when you go to the dentist or to the doctor or who's flying your airplane or you all have some idea in your mind about who that person, what they should look like, you know, how much education they should have, all those kinds of things. You already have that in you. So I was going to talk about that and how that unconscious bias is the now the new term, um, which was fun talking to Sean before we came. I just started unconscious bias training at my last job. Never had heard of it before. It was the nice way of saying how we're gonna deal with gender diversity issues at my company. And they just decided to talk about unconscious bias. And I thought it was kind of a cop out. Um, but after researching it more, it really is kind of, I don't know if you follow Sh Sheryl Sandberg and the Lean In and the women's movement in business, but they're now using unconscious bias is, is the main reason that we're seeing, we're seeing companies and, you know, all kinds of workplace environments being kind of set up the way they are. And then the last part of the discussion is, um, is some material that I've used in the past on training staff and mentoring staff about how to pick that right career, really think about what your skill set is, setting yourself up for success, um, understanding 
you know, what it really means to get into the workforce. How are you competitive? Why are people going to choose you? What are you, and, and how do you guarantee that you're going to be successful? Setting yourself up. So that's kind of how I thought today's discussion was going to go. So I'll start with um, a little bit about me, and then when the pizza gets here, we can just <laughs> stop Eat pizza. grab some pizza. But um, you know, throughout this is very, very casual. I have a couple slides in here that like discussion. You know, so I kind of want it to be. I want to hear what your opinions are um, on things and about maybe some of the experiences that you've had. Um, I'm not sure how much. I never felt discrimination in college but I was, maybe wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I was too busy <laughs> studying. Um, so then, so those are sprinkled throughout. And so, you know, by all means, please, you're welcome to stop and, you know, ask questions about, you know, whatever experiences and stuff that you, this is, I only have, through the, oh, and I have a couple of videos in here too, because there's, there's so much resources out there um, on the internet. I love TED Talks. I don't know if anybody ever watches TED Talks. I think they're just all the time. Okay, good. All the time. There's, there's an app you can get on your phone too that'll give you like the most popular ones. So if I'm in the car, I'll just push play and listen to the TED Talk on my way to someplace. Um, so I have a couple TED Talks that are just so much more eloquent than me on describing the issue and giving more of a global perspective of some of these things. And then we'll have like a little discussion afterwards just to kind of keep things moving. Does that sound all right? Cool. Okay. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. So, um, so here we are. My career path, the unconscious bias, and how it's kind of affected me, and and I think, um, and what we can do about it, kind of how to turn it around. And culture fit. This is the thing that where I'm at in my career, and this is the reason I started all over. I, I just realized that I have what I want for a culture is just really different than what's being offered. And so this was my way of empowering myself. And it's like, okay, I'm going to have my own. I'm a culture of one. <laughs> I, get, I get everything I want because um, I'm my own company now. And then, like I said, at the very end, um, talk about careers. And this, it, you know, the discussion today applies to everybody. It's not just gender issues. Um, but just kind of giving you a little bit of insight on the things that I have found to be as a manager and as a hiring person and as people, as a person who fires people, these are some of the things that I, I use to advise people on getting jobs. So, and actually being able to grow in, the, in their career the way you want. So, um, just real quick about me. This is where I've lived. <laughs> I haven't gone very many, very much places. I mean, there is 10 million people between where I live now and Santa Barbara. So I do have a good cross section of California. I figure I'm exposed to 30% of California. But um, so I went, I grew up in Orange County and a Fullerton, and I'm fifth generation Southern Californian. So yeah, I've been around for a long time. Um, went to Santa Barbara, well, went to Fullerton College for like four years. It took me a long time to get out of school. I didn't have funding and first, you know, first person in my family to go to college, all that stuff. I didn't know how to study, had dyslexia. All those little things cost me a lot of years, but it was a great experience. Love, love City College. Went there for a long time, then went up to Santa Barbara and um, got my undergraduate and <laughs> fell in love and did not take the the, the schooling option in Florida or Oregon and chose to stay and go to UCLA, which I wasn't really a big fan of, but that's going <laughs> to keep my relationship going. For love. For love. Um, so I went to UCLA and um, I knew that I did a, a couple of years after at UCSB just being a tech at the lab and did a lot of field work and that was fun. Went to graduate school and like Sean said, I was pretty driven. I just knew that I wanted to work in a company someday, and I knew I wasn't going to get a job being a marine biologist without a PhD. That was just, I was just like, there's no way I'm going to be competitive enough. I have to walk in, I have to have all these credentials before anybody's going to talk to me. So I just went straight in for the PhD, and I did the thing that nobody wanted to do. Again, I had no, I didn't care what it was. To me, getting the PhD was the process. It was learning how to do research, learning how to be independent, and then being able to defend yourself and stand up. And, and then when all the professors are like, you need to do some more experiments, and going, hell no, I am done, <laughs> I am walking out. And that's like the growing up, right? It was, I, there is nothing you can ask me to do. I have done absolutely everything, and I will defend it, you know. 
that's when you finally hit that point of being independent. And that was an amazing thing for my, for my career because especially in consulting, which is where I'm at, I have, I have a new problem every day. Oh, well, can you go tell me what the, you know, it could be anything. It could be even like tortoises or it could be anything. Can you go figure out what the impact is and we're going to put a tower here and can you go find out what the laws are and then how we're going to do a study design to do that. And I'm like, okay, it doesn't matter <laughs> that I have a marine ecology background because I have a PhD and I know how, I know the process, I know how to, I now know after all these years, you know, where the laws are located, how to go look it up, go look at everything that's, find out who the regulators are, talk to them and make the project happen. That's the kind of independence. And you can get that with a master's too. I'm not saying you have to have a PhD. That was just the path I went. But, um, or you can go with an undergraduate and you can just get experience on the With job a kick-ass undergrad like ESRN. That's right. right. So you don't have to, but the opportunities by the time I was graduating and I wanted to jump into a more management role, that was what it was required for me. So, um, so at UCLA, I did what nobody wanted to do, which was benthic ecology, because nobody wanted to sit under the microscope and count animals. And I was like, I don't care, whatever, <laughs> just give me something to do. Sean was doing the glamorous stuff and counting plants. And the plants was, are glamorous, thank you. And I was taking notes as he was doing it. So that's, that's why don't we just grab pizza? Sorry, keep talking to, to get to a break. Is that a positive It's one? a good one. Okay, yeah. all right, good. Sean was doing the glamorous stuff and I was doing the I didn't do the glamorous stuff. And just because it was like black bloodshot eyes after diving so much. I don't know if that's the Satan. Oh, that's when, Satan yes. Boy, yeah. yeah, that was, <laughs> that was with her husband. Yeah. <laughs> So then after I finished in graduate school and then went straight into consulting, and lucky enough that what I did in graduate school, the benthic ecology tools came in. Because the state of California passed a new assessment tool called the Sediment Quality Guideline, which is you integrate benthic ecology, sediment toxicity, and sediment chemistry together and you assess that quality of that sediment. And I became I'm like the state's one of the state's experts on this. Um, so I walked out of school with like the only person trained and I had lots of jobs offers. It was just total luck. So. Planning. <laughs> Planning. Luck. Yeah. So um, what do we do if we don't have luck? <laughs> well, you might. Become a benthic ecotoxicologist. Ah, benthic ecotoxic. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how strong benthic ecology is in the future. <laughs> um, it, so well, we can talk about that, like where I think environmental, my perspective of environmental marine sciences is going. But um, but so I've been in consulting now for about 15 years, and this is my absolute favorite project I've ever worked. I have two big projects, and I was going to show you about. This one is called this is Port of Long Beach, and they I do a ton of work for the Port of LA and the Port of Long Beach. They're great clients. They are municipalities. I don't know if you know that, but Port of Long Beach is the harbor department for the city of Long Beach, and Port of LA is the harbor department for the city of Los Angeles. And they are big, giant, giant um, entities. They do, you know, their annual budget is about $500 million a year. Um, they do improvements all the time. And this is a project called Middle Harbor where they were filling in the, the way of the future with cargo ships is huge backland areas. So they bring a ship in that has, now the ships now have 18,000 pieces of cargo on them. Those are like what you see on a, on a, on a truck is two, worth two. So there'll be a ship that comes in that, has, that can put 9,000 <laughs> trucks on the road. They can empty that ship in less than a day. Oh and it's all becoming automated, the entire thing. And so this project, this is the very first, this is the most efficient, greenest port um, wharf in the United States right now. They just finished it, and I got to be involved with the sediment management. It was a five million cubic yard fill. It was super, super glamorous work. And there was contaminated sediments from the entire region were brought in and I got to orchestrate all of that and determine like where it got placed, when it got placed and dealt with like five different huge construction companies. And the whole thing got filled. It took about two years to fill it up. Um, but in three months, we put in three million cubic yards. It was a huge amount of effort, it was super cool. 
but um, so I got to be involved with the permitting, the construction, the design, the engineering design. I was at the port almost every day. I absolutely loved it. And that project, um, I did that for about five years. The next project I've been working on um, since 2006, and it's gone with me to my three companies that I've been at. Um, this is the, I don't know if you've ever heard of TMDLs, or Clean Water Act, and if you have contaminants, that's a total maximum daily load. And so I am overseeing the port's um, compliance requirements for their contaminated sediments, TMDLs. And this has been an amazing experience. We went from having a document that, that was the regulation that came out wasn't linked to good science, and we've built a, a site-specific um, hydrodynamic contaminated uh, I mean, hydrodynamic sediment transport chemfake model that is linked with a site-specific bioaccumulation model, and we've been able to map out when you remediate uh, some sediments in a certain portion of the harbor, we can map out how that affects fish tissue at mm -hmm. the end. Um, and we can project it over a 20-year time period. And so now we just finished the models. We've just finished, it's, like I said, we started this work in 2006. We started doing the model development in 2009. The models are done and we're running them and now we're sitting down with regulators doing negotiations about where we're gonna clean up and what kind of an effect it has, which then translates to reduced human health risks from the ingestion of fish. Super glamorous. It's like it should be yeah. academic, but it's not. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a super cool project. So those are my favorite projects. Um, so I, through because of these projects and because of my relationships with the Port of LA and Long Beach, I actually have had a really quick career growth in the consulting world. In just a few years, I was able to bring in ten million dollars worth of work to my company just from the ports. That doesn't count the other projects I've been working on. I grew the local office, which was in Mission Diego, from six people to 30 people. And um, I made partner in my firm. And, um, and then I also even developed a vision plan for the company on what our long-term strategy should be, which is really not what a new partner is supposed to do at a firm. It's what the CEO <laughs> is supposed to do. But I had some really strong opinions on how they should be, <laughs> and nobody else wanted to do it, and so because I thought, I said, we need to have this, they said, great, you can do it. So anyways, it seems like it was, everything was going to be great, but I started to, um, started to have some problems. So I was, it was very much, when I became a partner, there was only three other women, and there was 40 men in the partnership. And as soon as I became a partner, then I was starting to get my share of the money of the, how the company was profiting, which for every penny I got, there was somebody who didn't get a penny. And that's when like the real aggressiveness of the business that I was in came forward. And I was very much limited to just working at the Port of LA in Long Beach. I wasn't allowed to do business development in other portions of the country or um, there was a lot of partners that were working together on projects and nobody would work with me on a project. <laughs> it was those kinds of things. I could go on with story after story after story. Um, I had kind of harassment type stuff written in my end of the year reviews. Um, I was not liked. Um, I should learn how to be more congenial and less intimidating because it doesn't make people want to be with me. All this stuff, right? I mean, and, I was never around these partners because I was in my own Southern California office working with 30 staff and never even interacted with any of the other partners. But every time there was a partner meeting or every time there was like an initiative to do something that required working together, nobody would work with me. And that was, you know, I, I, I said earlier how I never had, um, never had any kind of sexual um, misconduct or harassment or anything ever in my career and I think part of it was is because I walk into the room and I'm automatically totally intimidating I mean most of the time I wear heels so I'm like six foot two especially <laughs> because I have to walk into a room of all men in suits and so you you know you can do all kind you got to use what you have to make an impression to come up to stand I mean I was I was criticized for standing tall you know, why do you have to be so tall? Can't you be more demure? People will approach you. And I'm like going, 
Have you ever heard somebody say to a guy, you need to be more demure. People don't want to be with you because you're just too too direct. All you know? the time. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. So I started, this started building and building and building. And, um, and it just got to a point where it was like, it, all my ideas, I started, I started working with, um, I had my, my best friend at work was one of the male partners, and it got to the point where I never voiced my opinion. I would sit down next to him, and I'd be like, duh, 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 this is what we need to say, this is what we need to do. He'd stand up and say, this is what I got to do, and everybody's like, yes, 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 that's great. Brilliant. It is, because, but so I actually started to create that kind of negative image of myself because I knew that if I spoke up, it was completely rebuffed. So I went straight to my buddy. I told him what to say, stood him right up in front of me, and he was the hero. He also got the credit for growing the entire office. He also got the credit for all the sales that I did. And he was, he's like, I'm sorry, I know it's not fair, but that's just how it is. And you know, we'd share, we'd share the, the bonuses and everything at the end. And he's like, let's just focus on us being happy and working together and that we have a great environment with our 30 staff and forget the rest of the company. But it just got to the point where it's like, shut up. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well, I mean, it just got to the point where it's like, that's not okay. It's not about the money. It's not about the money. I, I'm so, so anyways, I started to really, I started to sit back and go, what is really bothering me? And it all started, well, this was, I won't go to that one right now, but it all started when I started examining the structure of the company. It was about 50%. This is just the technical staff of the company I was at. And this is the percent male and female. Oh my gosh, the key is not on it. The blue one is the female, <laughs> the brown one is, is the male. And I started to kind of, I started to look at patterns in the company. And I was like, why am I such a minority? I mean, and I had never really thought about my opinions in the partnership. I didn't really think of my opinions as being feminine or masculine. I thought of them as being good business practices. I think we need to do this. I think we should have a process that does this. And I started to realize that it, it actually, my opinions were, my opinions were things about inclusion and setting up a system so that, why is it that we we're not having any women eligible for partnership? You know, why did I have to outperform 70% of the partners before you let me in the room for three years? Meanwhile, you know, so I, they actually had to give me the partnership because the guy they really wanted to give the partnership to had done 10% of the work that I had done that year. So there was no way, because I forced a system before I was a partner of having a fair evaluation because the first time I was up for partner, they didn't get me in because they said that I was too difficult to know and I just <laughs> didn't have, and I was, I was, yeah. So the second time they put me up for partner, there was a process in place where they had to look at my metrics. And I was three times metrics of the guy that came into partnership with me. So they had no choice. And it was a huge fight amongst partners to make me a partner. So and that was why I was like, OK, well, I'm in the room now. And that's all that matters. Now I can start to make changes and start to like putting this process in, in place of how you become a partner was a brand new thing. Now it's. I've removed and put the right metrics where you're comparing things and the process and so, anyways, I started to look at what was going on and, and we started to see this pattern and I was like, well, why is this happening? Why are we not, why are these, these are the staff, associates, senior associates and partners in the firm and each one of those is a successive rank and each one of those is a significant more level of money. And, and I started, I really spent a lot of time, I broke it down into disciplines, I looked at, I did a whole bunch, I'm a scientist, and I did a whole bunch of analysis, how many years of experience, how long have you been with the company, how, what's your degrees, this company had a huge number of PhDs and PEs, and, which is the engineering equivalent, and, um, and I couldn't find these patterns about what was going on. So, I, two years before I left, um, oh, so here's the, sorry, giving it away. So I was trying to really think, you know, what is going on? Is this a female male thing? I mean, the women are just as qualified as the men, but what's going on? Are, are women choosing to not go for the promotions or are they not getting pulled up? 
like what's going on? So I was really starting to look at it. I, did, I told you I did this look at different skill sets. And then there was a lot of pushback on, well, I mean, when I was asked, the first time I went to my supervisor before I was a partner, he goes, really, you want to be a partner? He goes, but you have kids. And I said, yeah, I have kids, but I'm also working. You know, he didn't, I said, I had a stay at home, I had a half time stay at home husband. So that would make it okay. I'm like, yeah, but I got a husband who's helping me with all the kids stuff. So and he's like, oh, well, I just didn't even know you were interested. I can guarantee you, my supervisor did not say that to any guy. Mm -hmm. right. Really, no. did you, and it was, you know, and I was like, I was there ready to fix it. And I'm like, no, 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 really, I really want to. He goes, oh, well, you should have that be known because most people don't really know that that's what, that's a lot of, you know it's a lot of work to be a partner, right? <laughs> it's so neat for you to want that. Yeah, so, um, so, but there is a lot. There's a, and what I, what, and through a lot of the research that I've done on this topic, there's a lot of women that just opt out. There's a lot of people who just do, don't want to have to sit there and fight, like I did. Just like, but the thing is, I'm the breadwinner for my family, and I have children, and I have mortgage, and so I have a huge incentive to make that happen. It wasn't, it wasn't like I had a choice. And there's a lot of women who actually have the choice. And, and it, could I have just sat back and been like, yeah, I'll be fine, you know, because I've got, I got everything else at home is taken care of, and all that matters is that I have a balanced work life, you know, thing. And so I was kind of forced down a path because I was the breadwinner. But I really started to look at it, and I'm like, are we setting up other women? Are we? What are we doing here at the company? So um, this is this is what happened in 2016. The company decided to do a layoff. So just to familiarize yourself, so we, we analyzed, I analyzed the data two different ways. So this is male and female, and then this one is male and female. There's two different ways of looking at it. In this one year, this company had 300 and, probably about 320, 330 people at the time. And they did a layoff. And they presented the data to the partnership. And the one male layoff, was an Asian modeler on the East Coast that worked in a tiny little cubicle that didn't have any more billable work. These were eight women that were, <laughs> had eight women. No, and I said, and when they gave out the names, they never once analyzed it. They just said, here's HRs, HRs put out the layoffs. And I, I, I'm, I just remember it, I was like, um, does anybody notice this is all women? <laughs> And an Asian dude, like complete, this call ended right then. The CEO goes, um. You're difficult. Um, yeah. You are difficult. Yeah. No, they never yeah. even noticed. Not a single, 43, 42 people on the phone, head of HR, junior HR, attorneys who had to file the paperwork and do all the packaging of the layoffs. Not a single person noticed. Is that because they were just like worried about themselves, maybe? They they just had their head down and they looked at each individual person. They never actually looked to see back enough to go, oh, there's a pattern. They never even considered it. They just so focused in. And the reason <coughs> that people got laid off is because they didn't have billable work. It means they didn't have a manager that was making sure work was flowing to those individuals and that they were staying busy. Well, they had no work to do. Well, but they're junior staff. It's not their responsibility to go out and sell the projects. Right. It's the manager's responsibility to delegate the work down to the staff. So it's like, <laughs> wait a second. You, we have a problem where people are not delegating to women and, and so that's where the behavior comes in. But they all had different managers, you know. And so, so anyways, this call happens. Uh, we got to talk to the attorneys. Everybody, we'll get back to you. Hang I up. am not kidding. The call ended, and I was shaking. I was, I was just like, oh my God, I am at this company that just did this. We're gonna get sued. We're gonna. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. So when I, so then I looked at the data again. And um, I went in and I categorized the exit interviews. Um, so that's just, the, that's just the layoff one. But what was striking is the number of women that quit the company that year as well. 
These are technical people. This is not administrative help. These are engineers and scientists. They all left, and they all left. They all claimed career opportunities. Not a single, there was only one person out of, out of these 11 women who actually said, it's my manager. The rest of them were so afraid of burning bridges they were. They didn't. They didn't want to hurt their careers at their next place, and they were being difficult. Mm -hmm. By being difficult. difficult, they just said they went out. Well, why do you think they're out looking for another job? If they were really happy, they would not be looking for another job. If they were able to grow in their career, mm -hmm. they wouldn't be looking for another job. So we have this mass exodus of women. The other thing that's interesting is the ones that got fired and laid off, they blamed performance issues with women. They never blamed performance issues with men. It was, it was only one guy got fired for performance. But there's eight women that got fired for performance? <laughs> like, they like lack their own performance, I guess? Yeah, they said that they were just difficult and they didn't meet the, the demands. And I don't know that, and, and it probably was these women, I don't know for sure, I think that when it came to categorizing why men left, they didn't use performance as the thing. I just don't think as many, I think they worked with men mm -hmm. in, uh, in comparison, very general. I think that they spent more time investing on men helping them get through the performance issues. Mm -hmm. But when it came to these, this is why I think we have this pattern. I sent these emails to HR three times in 2017, 2016 to 2017. What are you gonna do? Complete silence. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Well, this is that's not that's not how we view it. <laughs> I'm a female partner. One of less than 10% of the partnership. I think we have an issue. When are you gonna do something about it? So, anyways, that was what I was leaving. HRs and the other partners did not see that this was an issue, and it's actually really an interesting discussion topic that I thought we could have because. This is a private company with independent ownership. They should be allowed to do whatever they want. It costs a huge amount of money to buy into this company. It, it's a, you may, it's Can entrepreneurial. Can you explain buy-in? I don't know if they understand. So to means. be a partner, I had to actually purchase shares of the company so that I could get the profit sharing back from the work mm -hmm. that I did. So I had to invest in this company. So the company was successful. It was growing every year. It was profitable. I got a piece of those profits every year. It is, it's built on entrepreneurship. It was built on seller doers. If you're a technical expert, then somebody should be calling you and you should be able to go in there and sell work and grow a business. And I had been really successful at growing the business. So is there really an issue here? If you're not strong enough to sit there, if you're a woman and you're getting fired, and you're not sitting there fighting <coughs> for your job, it's just survivor of the fittest. If you're not forming the relationships with the people who are actually gonna be able to lift you up the ladder, so should you just leave? Should you be one of these 11 people, women that left? Because they're like, dude, I'm not gonna work that hard to be appreciated. Mm -hmm. you know. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Why well, I sat there and I complained because I felt like, I felt like because I was a woman in the leadership, I had, the responsibility of saying something and trying to make a change you know but at the end of the day I left <laughs> I mean I tried for a little while and I was like oh, screw it I did the same thing as those 11 women you know so really what's the right leadership should I have stayed there and like just been absolutely driven should I sue the company and force them to do look at their practices and is it even required it's a private company you know that is their culture they build, they make money on building this networking, these strong relationships with staff. They've got their buddies, their go-to team. Those are people that they're very comfortable with. I will tell you, I pre preferentially chose to work with my team over somebody else's team because I had relationships and we had, and the same thing was happening. The men were getting promoted because they had super strong relationships with their supervisors. When top is all men, and you're right. forming relationships with your work, you're more likely to, men are more likely to form relationships with men. And, and it's hard to get that female pyramid started, right? And so 
it's it's actually a really interesting thing, and it's something you should think about when you're looking at an organization for a job. I mean, when you're starting off, you have some flexibility. You're just you're always going to be low man on the totem pole for a while, and then at some point, you're going to grow into seniority that you can make your own decision about whether this is a cultural fit for you. But really, at the I left, I was the I'm the only partner to this day who's ever left the company. Mm, wow. And you're the only woman. I'm the partner. only. Well, there was there's three other women partners, less than 10%. There's now they've grown and they're now at like 38 partners. But I'm the only partner who's ever left because the money was so good. Like, just put up with it. I can't tell you how many people just go, really? Just just put up with it. And I just couldn't, you know. So so I don't know, you know, in the long run, did I do a disservice to my family? I have a third of the income that I had before. I am totally working by myself. I want to be this leader and I have nobody to lead. I have no I have no employees yet. It's just started. It's just brand new, right? But it's like I, I am in control. <laughs> but I sit there and I'm just like you know, at some point, though, it, you have to think of the responsibility. Like I told you, I'm at the prime of my career. I have, I have all the resources and still all the energy to have a huge impact on how a company is being run. I can walk. I could have gone to an AECOM. I could have gone to some massive consulting company and been integrated that has, you know, something that has a more balanced. Um, maybe I would have looked for a company that had more balanced women leadership for sure. And I would have been able to be in, inserted, and I would have been immediately making an impact. Right. Meanwhile, now, if I'm lucky and my company grows as fast as it possibly can, I might be at like 20 employees <laughs> in 15 years. You know, the, the amount of influence I have is greatly reduced than what I had there. But I am happy. I totally made that decision. And it actually is a really interesting thing to think about. Are women more likely to make that decision of walking away from money to pursue some kind of happiness? That is a very stereotypical general statement, but it might be true. You know, it, it's it's kind of hard to. I my my male partner, who is still my very good friend and and still one of my best friends, he's like, I know it sucks. Well, what do I care? It's just a, it's just like I'm just gonna put up with it. He goes, I'm still going to make so much money by the time I graduate. He goes, so I'll retire early and, like, get on a boat while you're still working, you know? And this is, he's like, it's just, he's willing to put up with it. He can tolerate it, you know? So then it, that's where it becomes really a personal kind of thing. So, so that is, that's kind of, so for me, I left because the culture was not a good fit for me. And, and that I knew that I was just going to be miserable every single day. But I did have a good example. So I have a girlfriend who is a retired colonel in the Marine Corps, which is very rare. And we've had all kinds of debates on this because she's like, she is the one that kind of pointed out the cultural fit for me. She goes, Marine, Marine Corps is not going to change their culture to make it more acceptable for women. You either are a woman that enjoys that culture there and you assimilate to what's there, but they're not going to go all of a sudden and change, you know, the value system of the Marine Corps to make it more compatible and palatable for women. They have their own agenda, and it turns out it most likely fits in with male kind of value systems as well. Now there are women. All of and she did her. She did actually went after her after she retired because um, she you can retire from the government early from the military. She went off and got a PhD in women leadership. And um, she interviewed all of the generals. All the, there's only like five female generals in the Marine Corps. She interviewed all of them. And the one thing they all had in co common was they absolutely loved working for the Marine Corps. Loved every single bit of it. Yeah, they dealt with crap here and there, but they absolutely loved working for the Marine Corps. Do they love like the challenge of it or? Just the whole environment. They just, you know, she could probably go into way more detail. I'm sure she has her dissertation defense. Yeah. But um, but that was the thing they had in common. They were super successful. They went all the way to the top because they were really happy. And they and it fit with who they were. But there's that doesn't apply to 50% of the women, right? It doesn't apply to 50% of our culture. So it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. And so when you are thinking about your careers, and it like, may not be, like right now, you're probably going to take whatever you can get, right? It's just starting. You're just starting to build your, 
your resume and still trying to figure out exactly what you want to do. So right now, but think about in the future though, you're going to have these kinds of, of things to think about. Is this a right culture fit for you? And does and are you in a place, like a university probably has to have a lot more recognition about cultural differences. They probably need to have a more level playing field. Um, but I'm not so sure a private company has to. So, any, I, 